with that setup. Hi, everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. I'll be your host. This is our first lady series where we're going to be talking about Lady Bird Johnson. So thanks so much for being here with us. This is the first of many first lady programs we're going to be doing in our first lady series. After this one, we'll next be doing Dolly Madison. And so if you're watching this live on Zoom, that'll be taking place next Saturday. So you can be on the lookout for that. If you're listening to this after the fact, um, you can find it on our YouTube channel because we'll record that one as well. And then on Friday, March 31st, we'll be talking, 2023, of course, we'll be talking about Eleanor Roosevelt. So if you want to join us for that, that would be greatly appreciated. And if you're watching a recording of this, there should also be a recording of that program on our YouTube channel. But today we're going to be talking about Lady Bird Johnson. And she was born on December 22nd, 1912. And this program is actually an encore of a program we had last December for her birthday. So uh, we thought we would do a repeat so people could join us that missed us the first time. And Lady Bird passed away on July 11th, 2007. So that's the overview of that. Now, this is a two-part program if you're watching us live on Zoom. If you're watching the recording on YouTube, it'll just be a one-part program. But if you're watching us live on Zoom, this will be a two-part program. Part one, um, we'll be talking about Lady Bird Johnson and an overview of her life and her career and all the fascinating things that she was involved in. If you are watching us live, then at the end of part one, you can stick around. And part two, we're going to be watching this 26-minute video, which is Lady Bird Johnson giving us a tour of the White House. And it was recorded back in 1968. It's not as well known as like say the Jacqueline Kennedy White House tour that was done six years earlier. Uh, but that being said, it's still really cool to have her show us around the White House. You can be on the lookout for that. And speaking of the White House, uh, at the end of our program, I'm gonna tell you how you can visit the White House because they're having their annual spring garden tour in a few weeks. And so if you wanna walk around, the outdoors of the White House, check out their beautiful gardens, and get pictures like this of me and my wife, Michelle, in front of the White House. That would be your big opportunity to do so. So welcome. Thanks for being here. I'll be your host. My name is Robert. I'm Ergie from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, let's see a little bit about myself. I lived in Washington, D.C. for many, many years. Uh, currently, indefinitely, hanging out in Southern California, where I've also lived for many, many years, off and on. And that's a little bit about me. Oh, and I like visiting the White House. And we have our amazing, spectacular co-host, Patty, joining us once again today. Hi, Patty. How are you doing today? Hi, Robert. <clears throat> doing very well today. It's a lovely sunny day, Ooh, excuse me, sunny day here. And um, looking forward to this program because <clears throat> um, Lady Bird really was a fascinating first lady. Um, so most of them actually um, are very interesting. And you can learn a lot about the time <clears throat> and the... Um, specific presidents really just by learning more about the first ladies because they alone did not do it <laughs> the men you know <laughs> those, are, those are two great points number one the presidents did not do it by themselves uh, <laughs> definitely not and then yeah if you learn about the first ladies they usually had fascinating lives and you can learn about the history of what was going on at that point in time so those are two of the themes that we're actually going to be talking about today so good to see you patty thanks so much for being here feel free to chime in uh whenever you uh, would like to. All right, so let's talk about Lady Bird Johnson. Of course, she was the wife of Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson. So here's a portrait of him at the White House. Lyndon Johnson, somewhat of a controversial president. Um, his presidency uh, came into being after the assassination of President Kennedy in November of 1963. And then the kind of the two main things that he's known for uh, is the Vietnam War, uh, and then also the Great Society. So kind of one kind of um, controversial thing, uh, and then another one that helped kind of move things forward, so to speak. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but before we do that, let's talk about Lady Bird Johnson, and for the most part, we'll go through her life and career in chronological order. So Lady Bird was born in 1912, so a little over 110 years ago. That was why we had the program last December. It was her 110th birthday party uh, we were having, so let's talk about her years before the White House, and there's a lovely portrait of her. This picture was taken right after she got out of college. And 
And so if you were joining us live early on, we were playing some Texas themed music, Aaron Copeland's Rodeo, uh, to kind of give you thoughts of being in the great state of Texas, the Lone Star State. So Lady Bird Johnson, born on December 22nd, 1912, in a place called Karnak, Texas, which is in Harrison County, if you're familiar with the great state of Texas, in Harrison County, right on the border with Louisiana. And back then, it was a pretty small town. There were 38,000 people uh, that lived there. And so that's where Lady Bird Johnson is from. And here's a lovely photo of her as a young girl. Lady Bird Johnson's parents were Frederick Jefferson, also known as T.J. Taylor. He was born in 1874. And her mom was Minnie Lee. And so they were born in 1900 and they had three children. And let's see, so Lady Bird had two older brothers, Thomas, born in 1901, and Antonio, born in 1904. And then Claudia, um, as her legal name initially was, was born in 1912. Now a little bit about Lady Bird's parents. Uh, her father was a very wealthy businessman. Um, and so Lady Bird grew up in a very wealthy household. Unfortunately, her dad died just 17 days before the 1960 election, which made Lady Bird the second lady of the United States. Um, so unfortunately, he was not around to see that come to fruition. And then even sadder, Lady Bird's mom passed away when Lady Bird was only five years old. Her mom died from the complications from a miscarriage. Um, and so Lady Bird spent much of her childhood without her mother, unfortunately. And this is the house that Lady Bird grew up in. It kind of almost looks a little bit like the White House. This is known as the Andrews Taylor Home. It's the Lady Bird Johnson birthplace. Like I said, it's in Karnak, Texas. And it was built in the 1840s. It's what's known as a classical revival uh, style home from the antebellum period or the era before the Civil War. Um, this home is privately owned. Uh, so it's not open to the public usually and you can't go on tours or anything like that, but maybe someday. And then here's a picture of Lady Bird from many, many years ago, standing in front of the house that she was born in. And then this is the house in more recent times. So her father was a businessman and he was very successful and Lady Bird greatly admired his entrepreneurial skills, uh, which he would put to her advantage a little bit later in life. Now, why was she known as Lady Bird if her name was Claudia? Well, she was initially named after her uncle, Claude. So that's where her initial name, Claudia, came from. But why was she known as Lady Bird? Well, there's a really great quote from her nursemaid, Alice Tittle, who said about Claudia, she is as pretty as a Lady Bird. And so that nickname stuck and ends up becoming Lady Bird Johnson moving forward. Of course, the Johnson part comes later after she becomes married. So if you're wondering how Claudia became Lady Bird, it was from her nursemaid, Alice Tittle. And there's a great photo of Alice and Claudia or Lady Bird. Now, her father owned a lot of land. The property that Lady Bird was born on uh, was pretty extensive. It was hundreds and hundreds of acres. And if you're familiar with Eastern Texas, uh, there's a well-known state park called Caddo Lake State Park. And that park, a lot of it was actually from uh, Lady Bird's father's estate. He donated it to the state of Texas. Um, and then over time, they ended up acquiring other lands as well. So it's this big park. And a lot of it is former Lady Bird's father's former estate. And speaking of her childhood, if you wonder when, how Lady Bird got involved in beautification, environmental, things like that. That's one of the main things that she's known for her uh, efforts in that area. Uh, so I thought I'd give you a few quotes of Lady Bird so you can learn more about her. And speaking of her childhood, she said, quote, I spent a lot of time just walking and fishing and swimming. And so these are pictures from the park that was previously the property that her parents owned. And you can visit this park today. So imagine growing up in this type of environment. Imagine this being your backyard. That's what happened to Lady Bird. 
And so next time you're in East Texas, go check that out. And one of the things that I find fascinating, I've lived in Texas for, let's see, two and a half years. Um, and I visited many, many times. I have family from there. My grandmother was born in Texas. Um, is people have kind of an image of what Texas looks like. And that's kind of more like West Texas. <laughs> um, East Texas looks very, very different uh, than what people would expect it to be. So again, next time you're visiting the state, check that out, beautiful park. Then in 1930, uh, Lady Bird goes off to Austin, Texas to visit one of her girlfriends that was living there. And she ends up falling in love with the city and the area and it ends up leading to this lifelong relationship she has with Austin, Texas. So even though she was born in Eastern Texas, uh, Lady Bird, the place that she's most closely associated with is Austin, Texas. And she first visited there in the spring of 1930. Uh, it was a much different city or town back then. Uh, it was the capital of Texas, of course, but it was much smaller than it is now. Uh, and again, Lady Bird would end up spending the next several decades of her life associated with Austin, Texas. Now, one of the reasons why she fell in love with it is because when she was flying from her home to Austin, it just so happened to be when the blue bonnets were blooming. And one of the things that Texas is known for is its beautiful blue bonnets. And so Lady Bird was <laughs> flying in an airplane to Austin, looked out the window, looked down at the ground, saw all these beautiful blue bonnets, uh, and immediately fell in love with the area. And a few paintings of blue bonnets, if you haven't seen those before. Oh, Patty brought up a good point. East Texas more closely resembles its neighbors, Arkansas and Louisiana. That's very true. Thanks, Patty. Appreciate that. And so when Lady Bird ends up going to Austin to visit her friend, she, just, she had graduated from high school at this point in time. She decides to enroll at the University of Texas, uh, which is a well-known educational institution right in Austin. Kind of like the um, two of the things that Texas, Austin, Texas is known for is the state capital and then also, of course, the University of Texas. And at a time when not a lot of people went to or even graduated from college, uh, Lady Bird actually ends up getting not one but two bachelor's degrees. Uh, so she was a graduate from the University of Texas. In 1933, she earned a Bachelor of Arts in History uh, so Lady Bird was a big history buff. And then 1934, she went back and got a second degree, or I should say she stayed in uh, school and got a second degree. And she got a bachelor's of journalism in 1934. And both of those degrees were with honors. So that's very impressive. And then she topped it off with a teaching certificate. Um, so she was a smart cookie, as they say. Uh, and you know, now that might not seem as impressive, but you have to remember back in the 1930s, very, very few people graduated from college. If you look at the statistics, only five and a half percent of men graduated from college at that point in time, and even fewer women, only 3.8 percent of women uh, at this point in time graduated from college. And also interesting that she had a journalism degree, um, because this is an era when not a lot of women were in the journalism field. Um, so really interesting that she decided to pursue that. Uh, the teaching certificate, also interesting because um, she was a lifelong education advocate. And here's a picture from her around the time she graduated from college. One time I posted this picture on our Facebook page and um, asked people if they recognized who it was. And uh, a lot of people did not <laughs> did not recognize this picture, even though Lady Bird's one of our most well-known first ladies. So also while she's living in Austin, Texas, she ends up meeting a man who would impact the rest of her life. So Lady Bird, another, so it's interesting that she went to Austin to visit a friend, fell in love with the city, decided to enroll in the University of Texas because then on another occasion, she went to go visit one of her friends who was working in the state capitol. And this was in September of 1934. And it's where she would meet the love of her life. So imagine meeting the love of your life at the state capitol. Well, that's what happened to Lady Bird. She was visiting a friend of hers, and it just so happens this young guy walked in, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and he was immediately starstruck by Claudia or Lady Bird, uh, and they struck up a conversation. He asked her out on a date, 
And guess what happened? They did end up going out on a date. Now, if you've been to Austin before, uh, the most famous hotel in Austin is in downtown. It's called the Driscoll Hotel. It's very historic. Um, it's kind of maybe like in Washington, D.C., the Willard Hotel, um, or, you know, kind of like that. It's like an old school, um, really fancy hotel. Usually every big city has like a hotel like that. But anyway, in Austin, Texas, downtown is the Driscoll Hotel. And that's where Lyndon and Lady Bird went on their first date. They went out for coffee. And if you visit the hotel today, it's really beautiful, spectacular. I was fortunate enough to stay here uh, one time on a conference. And then I've been here a few times, like for lunch and dinner and stuff. Uh, my dad really likes this hotel and would visit me in Texas. So FYI, shout out to the Hotel Driscoll or Driscoll Hotel. And here's a picture from out in front. It's kind of also like the Waldorf Astoria uh, in New York City, you know, that kind of setting or scene, so to speak. And then if you go there, uh, there's actually a LBJ suite. It's named after him because he was president, but I think it should be the Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson suite. But anyway, um, and then you can see these are the official White House portraits of them, copies of the official White House portraits of Lady Bird and Lyndon Johnson in the presidential suite. And there it is. So if you're looking for upscale accommodations, you can stay here on your next trip to Austin. And some pictures. So just FYI, I didn't take these pictures of the presidential suite myself. They're from the hotel. <laughs> and then they had a very short courtship, only for uh, several weeks. And they ended up getting married down in San Antonio, Texas, at a place called St. Mark's Episcopal Church. So any of you are familiar with San Antonio, St. Mark's is a very well-known historic church. And that's where Lady Bird and Lyndon got married just a few weeks or several, I should say several weeks um, after they began dating. And here's the inside of the church. It's known for two things. Well, three things really. Number one, it's historic. Uh, number two, it has these beautiful stained glass windows. Number three, it's where a future president and first lady got married. So how about that? And here was their wedding. So remember, they met in September and they got married in November. It was a real whirlwind romance. Lyndon was a really go-getter. He told Lady Bird um, the first, on the first date that he wanted to marry her, <laughs> which I think now would probably freak people out. They would think that was uh, uh, a little crazy. But anyway, that's what they ended up doing. She initially said, she didn't say he was crazy, but she said something in effect like, um, know cool it buster uh but they but they did end up getting married november 17 1934 and they went on their honeymoon in mexico um lady bird wanted to go to mexico because she was really interested in mexican history and culture remember she was a history major in college um and she said it was interesting because Lyndon wasn't really interested in all that kind of stuff he really just wanted to talk about politics and his career in washington dc and all that kind of stuff. So kind of a sign of things to come. And then the couple ended up moving to Washington, D.C., where they would live for many, many years. Um, at the time, Lyndon was a congressional aide. That was his job. That's what he was uh, you know, doing for a living. He just happened to be in the state capitol on some business. And so that's where he met Lady Bird. And then look at this beautiful photo of them as newlyweds inside Washington, D.C. All right, so let's talk about Lyndon Johnson's first political campaign. He won it. He was running for Congress, and there is his campaign poster. And this was back in 1937, and he got a little bit of a boost politically because Lady Bird and her father donated $10,000 to his political campaign. Now, that was $10,000 in 1937 money. That would be a lot more today. Um, and then also... You didn't need as much money back then to run a election campaign because there wasn't as much money in politics. So $10,000 back in 1937 would have been a significant amount of money. Uh, and it was, and then it ends up winning the election. So, you know, remember we were talking out early in our program, Patty uh, made the comment about how, you know, a lot of presidents um, wouldn't have gotten where they got to or wouldn't have achieved what they achieved without their 
first lady spouses. That's absolutely true. Lyndon Johnson, classic example, um, his wife and father-in-law uh, made this major campaign contribution to his first election. Now, did you know, little known fact about Lady Bird, she was a millionaire businesswoman in her own right. And this is a really fascinating story that not a lot of people know about her. Um, she was a millionaire when she became first lady and she didn't get that money from Lyndon. Um, she earned it herself. And so let's talk about this. How did that end up happening? She bought a television studio in Austin, Texas called KTBC. And at the time, this was a um, radio station that was really struggling. Uh, it wasn't doing well, it was having a lot of financial problems. Remember, she has that journalism degree, so she knows a little bit about media uh, things. And she really admired her father, who was an entrepreneur, and thought, you know what? That's what I should do. I should do something entrepreneurial. And so she ends up buying this radio station. And so she invested back in 1943, $17,000 or $17,500 from an inheritance. Um, when her mom passed away, her mom left her an inheritance. And so the money was just kind of set aside. Um, and then and so Lady Bird used part of it for Lyndon's congressional campaign. And then she used some more of it to buy this radio station, KTBC. And Lady Bird really turned things around quickly. Uh, this is a picture of her out in front of the station. I think that's the general manager uh, of the station, if I'm not mistaken. And what she did was she revamped the whole entire station. Um, think about radio signals. She installed more, um, oh, I don't know what the, more terminals to broadcast the signal farther out and get more coverage. Um, she changed the programming lineup. Uh, she brought in people to do marketing, and advertising and sales. Uh, to get more you know, money coming in. And so all these changes she ended up making to the radio station really made it a big deal in Austin, Texas. And it became very, very successful. And she recouped her investment and then some in a very short time. These are a couple of advertisements from back in the day after Lady Bird had taken over. You can see this, a taller tower, more coverage right in the heart of Texas. And then this is talking about all the different kind of advertising options. And that station still exists, although it's been renamed KLBJ. So the station still exists. And then she later invested in additional radio and television stations throughout the country. And so her initial $17,500 investment made her a multi-millionaire. So uh, really fascinating that she accomplished this. And it's really uh, interesting that it's a well, not a well-known fact. I mean, it's not an unknown fact, but if you ask 10 random people what they know about Lady Bird Johnson, chances are none of them are going to mention this or even know anything about it. So really interesting uh, that she was a multi-millionaire in her own right. So she's also a great example of someone who persevered. So her and Lyndon tried to have children together, and unfortunately, they were not successful in this endeavor. Initially, she had three miscarriages, um, and they were really disappointed and distraught about that, as you can imagine. Um, but they continued on, they persevered, and then eventually um, they did have two children, Linda Bird, and who was born in 1944, and Lucy Baines, who was born in 1947. So if you go back to the um, radio station, she's doing that while she's also a mother. Um, so she's a working mom, wife, entrepreneur, et cetera, et cetera. And there she is with her two daughters. And you know, also too, you might not think the uh, radio station um, is a big deal, but you know, that was a time when not as a lot of women owned businesses like that or any type of business to that extent. So really interesting in that regard as well. Uh, this is like a well-known photo of her and Linda at home with the two kids. And this is the home that they lived in. If you are familiar with Washington, D.C., it's on 30th Place Northwest in the beautiful neighborhood. And this was the Johnson home from 1942 until 1961. So Lyndon Johnson initially goes to Washington as a congressional aide, then later he becomes a congressman or he was in the House of Representatives. 
and later he becomes a senator and then vice president and then eventually president but this is the home that they lived in for almost 20 years and what does it look like inside well i'll show you some pictures in just a moment there's a picture of them on the steps now they could afford a nice house because remember Lady Bird uh, made all the money with the radio station and Lyndon was doing pretty well for himself in the house and then later in the Senate. And this is a private residence now, but it was for sale a few years back. And so I grabbed a few pictures of it so you can see what it looks like now. I'm guessing the decor was probably a little more Texas-y <laughs> back when the Johnsons were living there. And so really beautiful home. Now, Lyndon uh, was very ambitious and very hardworking. Uh, if you study his life, he's also a very fascinating person. Uh, one of his kind of um, core philosophies that he was just going to outwork everybody, which is pretty extraordinary because in Washington, D.C., there's a lot of hardworking, <laughs> ambitious people. Uh, so to be able to outwork all of them uh, is really saying something. Now, Patty brought up a good point. Um, let's go back and... Now, remember Lady Bird, she's a media savvy person. She went to school for journalism. She owns this successful radio station. She's a entrepreneur and a businesswoman. Do you think that had an impact on her husband's career? Hmm, <laughs> I would say probably yes. Patty, what do you think? Um, oh, yeah. <clears throat> she was um, a traditional woman for the time. She did not um, broadcast a lot of her personal um, accomplishments and influence, but um, I, I do believe that she used it very intelligently um, toward furthering his career and ambitions, yes. Yeah, that's one of the things that's fascinating about First Ladies. They all have these very diverse backgrounds, but they oftentimes, almost always, end up using their backgrounds to assist their presidential husbands, whether it's Jackie Kennedy or Eleanor Roosevelt or Betty Ford or Michelle Obama, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, um, even really at the time, Robert, I mean, um, I doubt that a lot of people were aware of her own career and accomplishments and whether intentionally or not tended to compare her with her predecessor, Jackie Kennedy, um, and very unfairly because both of them were accomplished, but in very different ways. Lady Bird, of course, had some years on Jacqueline Kennedy, so had had more time to have done very interesting and very powerful things. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. And again, remember, that's a just very different era. And I don't think just reading accounts of their lives while they were uh, alive, I don't think many people outside of Texas knew about the whole media empire thing or maybe they heard about it oh she owns a radio station but i don't think a lot of most people knew the kind of the extent of her business savviness and and like you said media savvy and you know that definitely would have um benefited her husband to a great extent and this was in pre-dallas days i mean the tv program dallas so a lot of people didn't know a whole lot about texas um it was kind of an outlier i think it was um kind of shocking that that was where um, JFK was assassinated and perhaps, you know, was a lot of people's first awareness of Texas being the kind of uh, influence, influential place it was um, with the kind of history it had. So anyway. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you know, this is an era for the internet, of course, and television was just getting started, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, great point. Um, so the 1960 presidential election, Lyndon Johnson was initially running for president himself. Um, over a course of time, he decided that wasn't going to materialize. Um, John F. Kennedy asks him, Lyndon, to be his running mate. He accepts. And that's a whole uh, long drawn out story you could spend a lot of time talking about but suffice to say uh, they end up partnering and uh, another way that Lady Bird influenced history her and Lyndon quite possibly helped the Kennedys carry Texas um, and without Texas some of these other things that Johnson did on the campaign trail um, who knows maybe President Kennedy wouldn't have been elected it was a very 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 close election 
the election of 1960 and John F. Kennedy won by a hair. Um, and so I gotta think that Lyndon and Lady Bird helped with that. And so then Lady Bird ends up becoming the second lady of the United States. She's the wife of the vice president. Um, so here's a picture of her in the center with her two daughters. And what are they doing? They're getting ready to go off to the inaugural ball. So um, if you're ever in Washington, D.C., either living or visiting, um, if you get a chance, go to a presidential inaugural ball. Um, I've done that myself. It's a really cool experience. Also, here's a picture of Lady Bird and her daughters. And here she is by herself. And again, it's unfortunate her father had passed away just 17 days before the 1960 election. Um, so he didn't get to experience this. And then remember her mom passed away when she was five, but they were no doubt very proud of her as was the rest of her family. And uh, Lady Bird involved in quite a few things as second lady of the United States. One thing in particular, she traveled a lot. So this is fascinating to go back in time and look at this. This was a trip uh, that her and her husband took to a little known place in Asia called Vietnam. Um, so this, it's really fascinating to go. There's dozens and dozens of photos of Lady Bird um, in Vietnam. It's at the presidential palace, that's her there on the left. And then here's Lyndon. So, I mean, if there's a lot of fascinating things about being first lady or being second lady, uh, one of them is just all these different people you meet and all these different places you travel to uh, and things like that. And again, this is before uh, the heavy military involvement in Vietnam, uh, but the Kennedy administration, uh, like the two or three previous administrations, realized that Vietnam was a very um, important political, military, economic situation. Um, so starting to put more emphasis on that. And then here is Lady Bird with Jackie Kennedy. This photo, of course, was taken before the assassination. And the Kennedys had a lot of White House state dinners. Uh, so I really, I really like this picture of John F. Kennedy, Jacqueline Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Lady Bird, uh, are all dressed up for a state dinner at the White House. And then Lady Bird's role or life and career really goes on a different trajectory. Um, after the assassination of President Kennedy, just like the same similar thing with her husband. So let's talk about this for a moment because this is one of the most well-known uh, and important events in American history. And Lady Bird had a, essentially a front row seat to this event. The Kennedys came to Texas. Uh, they were visiting San Antonio, Houston, Fort Worth, Dallas. Then they were supposed to go to Austin and then they were going to spend the night at the Johnson's Ranch um, in Central Texas, Lady Bird, Lyndon Johnson. So if you don't know the story, after Dallas, the Kennedys were supposed to go to Austin, Texas, where he was going to deliver a speech. And then they were going to go to a barbecue and spend the night at the Lyndon Lady Bird Johnson Ranch in Austin, Texas, or outside of, um, it's actually west of Austin, Texas, um, and then fly home. And of course, those last two things did not happen. Um, so Lady Bird was there. Uh, in the motorcade when the assassination took place. And if you read her autobiography, which I highly recommend, she goes into great detail about a lot of different topics, including this particular event. So I thought I'd read a few excerpts um, so you can get kind of a firsthand account of what she saw in Dallas. She said, it all began so beautifully. After a drizzle in the morning, the sun came out bright and clear. We were driving into Dallas. And then a little bit later, she says, the streets were lined with people. Lots and lots of people, the children all smiling, placards, confetti, people waving from the windows. And there's a picture of the motorcade on what was up until that point in time, a beautiful day in Dallas. Suddenly, there was a sharp, loud report. It sounded like a shot. Then two more shots rang out in rapid succession. There had been such a gala air about the day that I thought the noise must come from firecrackers, part of the celebration. Then, over the car radio system, I heard, let's get out of here. And our Secret Service man, Rufus Youngblood, vaulted over the front seat on top of Lyndon, her husband, threw him to the ground and said, get down. The car accelerated terrifically, faster and faster. 
Then suddenly the brakes were put on so hard that I wondered if we were going to make it as he wheeled left and went around the corner. We pulled up to a building. I looked up and saw a sign, hospital. Only then did I believe that this might be what it was. And this is a picture of the car that the Kennedys were traveling in. You can see the, these are flowers that Jacqueline was holding. So, of course, this turns the whole uh, country upside down. And this is a short time later, Lyndon Johnson, Lady Bird's husband, being sworn in on Air Force Run. So this picture was taken in Air Force One. Uh, it's sitting on the tarmac at Love Field in Dallas. Uh, here's Lyndon, here's Jackie, and here's Lady Bird. And this photo was taken just a little over two hours after President Kennedy had been shot. So this is very, I'll say, raw, so to speak. Um, and then here's a photo of Lady Bird. Um, there's a great film about Jacqueline Kennedy called Jackie with Natalie Portman. It's a film I really like a lot. But one of the things I don't like is they portrayed this event very differently than how it actually took place. In the film, uh, they make it seem like Jackie was all by herself and the Johnsons, once the um, swearing in took place, just kind of you know, left her. That's actually not the case at all. You can see photos of this event taking place. And you can see here's Lyndon and Lady Bird trying to comfort um, Jackie. So a little bit different. And you have to be careful watching Hollywood films because they, they every once in a while, not very often, of course, but every once in a while, <laughs> they um, skew the facts and people kind of accept those at face value. This is an example of that, but a very touching moment. All right, let's talk about Lady Bird's White House years. Before we do that, Patty, anything to add about the Lady Bird years up until the White House? I really like the way she described the events in Dallas. She didn't sensationalize them at all. And um, <clears throat> she, she made you feel how um, shocking they were without having to use those words. So she, she really did a good job with that, I think. Yeah, I thought it, myself personally, it was really interesting just hearing her account because, um, you know, you, you see different accounts of things that went on there. You know, you, of course, it usually almost always focuses around President Kennedy and Jack Kennedy, which you would expect, um, but kind of interesting to get it like a different perspective from someone uh, who's actually physically there and experiencing all this. Like you said, the words were really um, interesting. Lady Bird kept a diary. Um, for much of her life. And then later on, when she became for city, she was recording her diary so she could uh, kind of document more of what was taking place. Yeah, and the juxtaposition of, of Texas entrepreneur, media savvy person <laughs> versus she had a very cultivated um, uh, persona about her, very, she, very well spoken, very, um, I don't want to use the word gentle because it implies something that I don't want to imply, but very cultivated, I guess is what you'd say, and not something that you run across oftentimes nowadays. Um, for better and worse, I think a lot of women are more um, um, agenda forward, shall we say, and she managed to balance it beyond what we often see, I think. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. I would agree with that. Let's see, there was a great quote um for her she said oh let me scroll forward a little bit she said quote this is a, i didn't write this one down but she said i've really tried to learn the art of clothes because you don't sell for what you're worth unless you look good isn't <laughs> so, that a great quote yeah <laughs> yeah so i thought that was i was going to include that in the program with it I did make it at the last minute, but anyway. All right, well, let's talk about- Lady We have Bird a question here that is actually apropos. Um, why were the Prez and VP together in Dallas? Um, that was because the whole reason um, LBJ ended up as the vice presidential pick initially was to kind of try to sew up that Southern vote. At that time, the fairly new um, John Birch Society had gained some purchase in those Southwestern states. So it was considered really important to the overall strategy to have him as the vice president. And because there continued to be some sorts of discontent in that part of the country, um, it was considered very important for um, LBJ to indicate his support of the administration. I don't know if you want to add to that, Robert, but that's my remembrance of. Oh, yeah, no, that's that is a great question because, yeah, so the 1960 election was very close. And, you know, now President Kennedy is very popular 
um, in November of 1963 or the fall of 19. There was a lot of questions about whether or not he was going to get reelected because his popularity had really gone down a lot. And so they go to Texas to kind of unofficially kick off the 1964 uh, campaign. The Johnsons are from Texas, uh, so it makes sense to go down there. So they, the Johnsons were really hosting the Kennedys. Uh, in Texas, but yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, they were going to, I think, finish up at, at the LBJ Ranch, were they not? Um, correct, yep. Yeah, yeah and right. even in 1960, I mean, it was kind of, remember how close that election was? So there was a lot of um, strategizing that went into um, convincing LBJ to come on as vice president, because as you said, he had hoped to be nominated himself. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it was, very close uh, in this 1960 election. Remember that uh, Kennedy was very overtly Irish and he was um, Catholic. And that at the time was a, a huge issue. Oh yeah, no, it definitely was. I mean, um, it's, it's interesting over time how people kind of focus or gravitate. I think we should probably move on. If you, if you want to learn more about the President Kennedy assassination, I did a program and I reported on a YouTube channel that talks all about the trip to Texas and what they were doing and where they went uh, before the assassination. Like I said, they went to San Antonio and Houston uh, and Fort Worth, and they were supposed to go to the Austin and the uh, Johnson Ranch and such and such. So yeah, check out our YouTube channel, Washington DC History and Culture. There's a big um, program on there. And actually this November is the 60th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. There's gonna be a lot of programs taking place related to that, I'm sure. So let's talk about Lady Bird in the White House. Um, so again, very media savvy. I really like this portrait of her that appeared on Time Magazine. Think about the big shoes she had to fill, so to speak. Jacqueline Kennedy was hugely popular, probably the most popular first lady in history. And to follow in her footsteps under any circumstances would have been extremely challenging, but even more so, uh, because of the assassination of President Kennedy. And so really challenging to be First Lady at any point in time, but even more so um, the situation that Lady Bird was thrust into, but she excelled in that regard. Um, and then because the Dallas trip was really kind of like the unofficial kickoff the presidential campaign, uh, Lyndon Johnson decides relatively early in his tenure that he's going to run for president in 1964. So almost immediately they have to begin campaigning. And Lady Bird actually was traveling around the country by train. Uh, and this is the train that was called the Lady Bird Special. And so this was an era when more people traveled by trains they do now. And so she was making all these different campaign stops and going out and speaking. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting because you don't really see uh, before this a lot of women uh, out on the campaign trail to this extent. They were they were to a certain degree here and there, uh, but not to this extent. And so she really kind of changes the whole dynamic of um, presidential spouse, so to speak, or future presidential spouses uh, getting heavily involved in the campaign trail. So she wasn't the first um, woman to help her husband on the campaign trail. My point is she really kind of took it to a whole nother level and really kind of changed the dynamic, so to speak, because you really hadn't seen a lot of this before. The exception of maybe Eleanor Roosevelt, and to a lesser extent, maybe um, Pat Nixon. Um, so the Lady Bird special. And the 1964 election was not close at all. Um, now, Lyndon Johnson is not one of our more popular presidents, in my opinion, um, primarily because of the Vietnam War. Um, if you go back to November of 1964, though, he was very popular. And you can see that election was a landslide. Um, so he won very easily. Uh, his opponent was from Arizona. And then there were some issues with his civil rights initiatives, uh, which caused him to lose the southern states. But other than that, it was pretty much a clean sweep everywhere else. If you want to learn more about the First Ladies and if you're in Washington, D.C. or ever visiting there, I really recommend going to the Smithsonian American History Museum. They have a great exhibit on the First Ladies that you can go check out. And they have a lot of different things. Two of the more well-known aspects of the First Lady's exhibit uh, are the First Lady's gowns. And so these are different dresses that women have worn over the course of time. A lot of them are like inaugural um, ball gowns or gowns from like different state dinners and things like that. So like for instance, here are a couple examples from Lady Bird. And so here's the dress. And then this is a top coat that you could put on over the top of it. 
And so this is one of those um, out the exhibits most known for the dresses. Um, but then they have this other section where there's dresses within like the context of other historical things that happened to the first ladies. And then here she is wearing the dress. Back when women wore gloves. Patty, when did women wearing gloves go out of style? Any idea? I <laughs> think um, these 60s ladies were near the end of the trend. Probably um, people that were in, you know, more prominent public and, and formal roles um, may have continued it. But by the late 60s and 70s, the baby boomers were having none of it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. I appreciate that. I was, as you were talking, like, yeah, now that you mentioned, I don't recall seeing women from the 70s very often wearing these gloves. But... You probably would have seen Betty Ford and Pat Nixon wearing them. I'm sure there are pictures of them wearing these yeah. kinds of gloves. But um, like I say, not people in more ordinary levels of life. Um, right. uh, even, you know, probably movie stars, you wouldn't have seen it really going into the 70s. Uh -huh. um, and what about these too, colors? A nice oh, yellow gold. <laughs> gorgeous. I always think of the yellow rose of Texas every time I see her in these yellow gowns. Um, also, too, uh, Robert, I put into the chat, um, the National First Ladies Museum does programs every month, and they have really good um, programs, connections, themes. They're a lot of fun. So, oh, and yeah, they have great fun, programs. So. Yeah, the National First Ladies Library, you should Google that. They have uh, several programs every month. We've actually partnered with them on different um, endeavors over the course of the past few years so shout out to them as well and so this dress that lady bird's wearing you can see at the smithsonian there's one side so there's the back and there's the front and so they have a lot of the um some people call the first ladies exhibit the smithsonian the dresses and dishes exhibit because it also has the first um ladies or the White House China um, display, but there's a lot more to the exhibit than just that. So make sure you check that out. And of course, when you are the first lady, you get to travel a lot. Um, so here are the Johnsons in Hawaii. And then another visit. Lyndon and Lady Bird were a really great political couple, and she was a really key advisor for him because she was very um, sharp and media savvy and politically savvy. Um, he relied heavily on her judgment on a number of occasions throughout their times together. And here she is posing for a portrait as First Lady. So it must have been really amazing to go from growing up on a a small town in Texas, and then fast forward many, many years, and you're living in the White House. And some portraits from them. Initially, Lyndon was very popular. Uh, like I said, remember the 1964 election, but over time, the, the Vietnam War uh, really sapped his popularity. Historians have a really kind of mixed opinion um on johnson they do like his race relations and um the social programs he implemented stuff like that and then the vietnam war is uh, very controversial so but you might if you if you look historians the uh, c-span does a poll of historians and you might think lyndon johnson was you know a terrible president or whatever but he's actually held in pretty high regard amongst the story i would say he's like middle of the pack um, just so to speak just to give you that context now, what were some of the things that were going on in the White House at this point in time? One of the key initiatives that Lady Bird was involved in was the Head Start education program from 1965. Um, so she wasn't the founder of this program, but she really um, um, promoted it and got heavily involved in this and really helped it get going. Um, so what is the Head Start? Launched in 1965, Head Start is a program that provides comprehensive early childhood education health, nutrition, and parent involvement services to low-income children and families. The program's services and resources are designed to foster stable family relationships, enhance children's physical and emotional well-being, and establish an environment to develop strong cognitive skills. The transition from preschool to elementary school, if you can remember back in those days for yourself, imposes diverse developmental challenges that include requiring the children to engage successfully with their peers, outside the family network, 
adjust to the space of the classroom and meet the expectations of school the school setting provides so lynn or lady bird johnson is most known for environmental uh, initiatives and beautification stuff like that but this is something that uh, doesn't quite get as much recognition uh, that it should and she was really really proud of this remember she was very highly educated she had a teaching certificate um etc etc et so in addition to being politically savvy and successful entrepreneur she was also heavily involved um, and interested in different educational initiatives, including Head Start. So here she is visiting a school in Washington, D.C. and interacting with the kids. And there's that yellowish gold color again. I don't know what the actual name of that color is, but you see it frequently in the 1960s and into the 1970s. I think Harvest Gold is what they call it. Oh, Harvest Gold. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> And I really like that um, scarf she's wearing. That's cool. Yeah, gorgeous. And then imagine that you're a parent and your daughter gets married. Wow, that would be pretty spectacular. I don't have kids, but I can imagine that would be a great event. Uh, or imagine having two daughters and they both get married. Well, imagine having two daughters, they both get married, and both of the weddings are at the White House. Um, so that's what uh, Lady Bird Johnson got to experience. So while she was first lady, her and Lyndon hosted their two daughters' wedding. So these were like two of the big uh, kind of social events that took place during the Johnson administration. So Lucy Johnson married a gentleman by the name of Patrick Nugent in August 6th of 1966. And since everyone likes to look at wedding photos, let's go back in time and see the Johnson wedding. So this was a big deal, as you can imagine. Got a lot of media coverage. And look at that beautiful dress. This picture is taken at the White House. So how cool would that be to get married at the White House? And there's a lovely young couple. And here's a great photo. Note the Secret Service men trying to look incognito. And they're there at the White House. So the ceremony was at a church in Washington, D.C., and the reception was at the White House. And there's the cake. So if you're the daughter of a president, it makes wedding planning a lot easier. You can take advantage of the setting here. Oh, I didn't know this. Here's an interesting point from Patty. Lucy converted to Catholicism prior to marrying the Catholic Nugent, which also made national headline. I wasn't aware of that. Patty, and you want to elaborate on that one? I wasn't familiar with that part of the well, story. Just that, um, again, remember, um, it was a very controversial affiliation when JFK was elected. And then here it comes around again. So yeah, we we have historically been a very Protestant country from our earliest days. So <clears throat> there's always been some degree of controversy around that. And uh, the, it was just of interest because here was somebody, a young person in, in this particular time, which was, was a roiling social time, uh, who was making this sort of a decision. And both of their husbands, by the way, um, were... Um, military figures who both uh insist they both went to vietnam and again remember the level of controversy that was coming around then so these women <clears throat> became part of the zeitgeist at the time if you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah no i'm thank glad you mentioned that because i wasn't aware of that part of the story but it is interesting to know the context of that uh, in light of all the different things that have happened before and since but well, yeah, we I don't know if, if people weren't alive at that time, they might not remember how shocking um, and violent a lot of the protests got. I, again, granted, 66 was prior to that, but still <clears throat> the movement was beginning to build. And I believe uh, I, I can't remember if the Gulf of Tonkin was 64 or 65, but I think 65 was when um, and again, partly because LBJ was torn as to what he was 
doing in Vietnam versus his domestic programs, that was part of the whole strategy was to have these, you know, male um, fiancés, dates, whatever, of these young ladies as this was developing become part of that Vietnam effort. So again, when I say media savvy, I don't just say it casually. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it is, it is, it is a really important point. And um, yeah, I, so if you go to the White House Visitor Center, which is around the corner from the White House, uh, it's open to the public. I think it's open seven days a week. Anyway, they have uh, video clips of different people that lived in the White House, presidents and first ladies and their children. I don't remember which one it was, but one of the Johnson children talked about how living there, she could distinctly remember hearing all the protests going on outside um, yeah. against the war, but not to be outdone, Linda also decided to get married and she also had a White House wedding. She married Charles Robb in December 9th, 1967. So let's look at the photos from this one. And here's the beaming proud father of the bride, leading her down the stairs. Chuck Robb went on to have a political career. Yeah, governor of Virginia, mm -hmm. other things. And like, yeah, they actually had the serve, wedding. Yeah, didn't he serve in Congress at some point too? Yeah, he had a really long uh, political career. We'll see some pictures of him in just a minute. But yeah, beautiful wedding. And there is the bride and groom. And he was in the Marine Corps at this point in time. And again, just imagine how spectacular it'd be to have a White House wedding. That would be um, believable to either attend or to be a participant in. And then there he is with the cake and the sword and Lady Bird and her husband in the background. It's a nice photo of them. And then some formal photos. So again, a really great setting for a wedding. And so these are like really two big um, social events you can imagine uh, that took place during Lady Bird's time in the White House, her two daughters' wedding. And then um, then she becomes a grandmother. And hey, how nice would that be to push the stroller of your grandchildren around the White House grounds? And so that's what Lady Bird got a chance to do. Uh, one of the things the Johnsons were known for, they were really active socially. Uh, they were very gracious hosts and they held 19 state dinners. A state dinner is when the president and first lady invite um, some other couple um, that's in power from another country to be an official guest at the White House. And so 19 different times during the Johnson administration, they hosted events like this. And so there's a lot of great photos of Lady Bird from these events. And I think Jacqueline and uh, JFK had really powered up that state dinner. Yeah, uh, they did. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, it was, it was, oh, I was just going to say it was the start of the jet age. So people were able to travel a lot easier. The United States, you know, more of a global power, wants to really partner with other countries. Yeah, and it did not last much beyond LBJ, I don't think. I think it really got scaled back very quickly. Yeah, it really goes up and down depending on the um, president. So some have had a lot and some. Uh, not very many. So it's just really interesting how they take different approaches to that. I'll look at this beautiful photo of Lady Bird at the White House. This is in the blue room, one of the rooms that's open to the public if you get a chance to visit. And then this is a famous photo of her at another state dinner. You know, it takes a certain kind of person to, uh, you know, the whole uh, press corps, not only in the United States, but also wherever the people are from that you're hosting is on this event. So you're really under a lot of scrutiny. Uh, there's a lot, you know, pressure filled situation. So, I mean, just inviting anybody over to your house is kind of a big deal, but imagine even more so for a state dinner. But uh, Johnson's again had numerous different occasions to host people and very successful at. And so, a lot of the pictures of her um, from the White House era are these state dinner type events where she's all dressed up and interacting with these different people. There wasn't quite as much media, I shouldn't say there wasn't quite as much, there wasn't as much, period, uh, media coverage on the present First Lady as there is now. I mean, there, there was a lot, um, but it's basically increased since then. It's been there before the internet and social media and all that stuff. And oftentimes when visitors come to the White House to meet the present First Lady, they bring gifts from wherever they're from, so all different types of things. So here's Lady Bird checking out a sword. Lyndon received as a gift. And of course, dancing and music and food and all that kind of stuff. 
I was really super flattered one time. I got to have dinner at the White House. It wasn't a state dinner. It was a dinner reception, uh, but really incredible experience to get to participate in that. So if you ever get such an invitation, make sure you take advantage of it. And one person that did get an invitation to the White House was Prince Margaret. And she visited the White House in November of 1965. So this was also a big social event that took place during the Johnson's administration. Prince Margaret, and here's Lady Bird. Uh, not sure what they're talking about. <laughs> she looks, <laughs> she's giving her some good advice, perhaps. Listening very intently. And there's the gloves again. And then a little bit happier photo. And let's talk about Lady Bird's environmental initiatives. So here she is out with wildflowers in the state of Texas. That's one of the things she's known for. It was her love for wildflowers. And Lady Bird is really considered the environmental first lady, the time when the environment really wasn't a priority or a topic of discussion. I mean, even today, uh, not uh, talked about as much as it should be probably. Um, so she's really a trendsetter in this regard, really making this a big issue. And if you're in Washington, D.C. or have been to Washington, D.C., you might recognize what she's doing. She's actually planting a cherry tree. They're about to have the Cherry Blossom Festival in Washington, D.C. Make sure you check that out someday. And so let's see, I originally from Detroit. I lived in Washington, D.C. Uh, different occasions for many, many years. In my opinion, it's one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Um, the buildings and the monuments, the memorials and all that stuff really spectacular. One of the things that makes Washington DC really beautiful is just all the trees and flowers and green open spaces and things like that. And not to say that Lady Bird was the only person responsible for that. It was many, many people over the course of time, uh, but she really played a significant role in beautifying the city. Here she is working on a project where she's trying to have more green space in the city, like less, less concrete, more green space. Um, her husband passed a number or got uh, through a number of legislative acts in this regard. So here's Lady Bird. Oops, let me go back to that picture. This is Lady Bird uh, looking over the shoulder of her husband, Lyndon, as he signs one piece of legislation into law. And so this is a classic example of the impact that Lady Bird had on Washington, D.C. So the next time uh, you're in the city walking about and notice something beautiful as you kind of think about Lady Bird. So this is like a before and after picture. So here's a street scene. This is actually um, just outside of the National Mall. You can see the Capitol off in the distance. And the National Mall, you can't see, but it's over here. So like all the Smithsonian and the monuments, memorials stuff. And so this is a side street, uh, a little bit south of the mall. And you know, it doesn't look too bad. It's kind of some grass and some trees and some, you know, park benches. But Lady Bird just thought, you know, this is the capital of the most important country in the world that looks should look better than this. And so that was one of her visions. And so they end up getting things like this. And wow, look at how different that is. Um, so which would you rather prefer to see <laughs> when you're walking around DC? Would you rather see this or would you rather see this? Which is uh, now I think people in DC really take this for granted. There is these beautiful open spaces that have a lot of trees and shrubs and bushes and flowers and stuff like that. But Lady Bird really played a big role in having that materialize. I think this as well, Robert, um, consciously or not, um, picked up on um, some efforts that Jacqueline Kennedy started. Didn't Jacqueline Kennedy um, kind of play a big role when uh, DuPont's circle was about to get flattened or something? And that Yeah, Lafayette Square. Yeah, she did. Exactly. Um, yeah, she re they really kind of complimented each other in that regard. Jacqueline was kind of more focused on like architecture. Uh, and things like that, and interior furnishings and things, and then Lady Bird on the outside um, stuff. So yeah, they played a great role. They complemented each other really nicely. And then look at this beautiful picture. Uh, this is uh, a park, uh, Potomac Park, uh, on the way outside of Washington, D.C., on your way to Virginia. And you got no beautiful flowers. This is not far from the White House. kind of you know branch out a little bit further just kind of walk around and notice your surroundings or, or if you're, you're working there maybe just kind of focus on uh, going to work and stuff but really beautiful city and here's a great photo 
um, Lady Bird and one of her friends. And this is another park outside of DC. So I think people maybe don't uh, realize or don't appreciate the, how beautiful the city is. It's really spectacular in that regards. And did you used to collect stamps or maybe you still do? Um, it was a stamp series that featured this beautification initiative back when stamps were only six cents. <laughs> so you can see plant more, plant for more beautiful parks, plant for more beautiful cities, plant for more beautiful streets, and plant for more beautiful highways. And you'll notice that two of these images feature Washington, D.C. Here's the Washington Monument, and here's the Capitol. So look at these cool stamps. And the capital. The Jefferson Memorial. So you get the idea. Then Lyndon Johnson in 1968 announced that he was not going to run for re-election. He was able to uh, run for re-election if he wanted to because the initial term that he served, uh, he had taken over for President Kennedy. So he could have won run in 1968, but the presidency really wore him down by all accounts. And so he decides not to run. Uh, this was uh, shortly before then Robert Kennedy decides he's going to run. Then he got assassinated and just all the other stuff that was taking place in 1968, like the Tet Offensive and Martin Luther King getting killed, and et cetera, et cetera. So 1968, uh, kind of a lot of stuff going on. And so the Johnsons decide that, you know what, we've really had enough of politics in Washington. It's time to retire and go back to Texas and let other people move forward. So the Johnson has always maintained uh, the Washington DC residents and then their ranch in Texas. Um, but they were looking forward to spending more time in Texas. And so this was the plan moving forward. So here's a nice touching photo of them. Uh, this is shortly, this picture, I believe, if not mistaken, was taken shortly after uh, Lyndon Johnson announced that he was not going to be running for re-election. And they're back home in Texas kind of walking and probably planning their future and what they're going to be doing afterwards, post White House. And they're probably thinking, well, you know what, we can go walk and look at the flowers and talk and all that good stuff. So what a career it was for the two of them. But they're not quite out of the picture just yet. And another touching photo of them in the Texas Hill Country. All right, so let's talk about Lady Bird's life after the White House. A lot of first ladies did a lot of fascinating things after they left the White House, including Lady Bird's. So let's talk. About so as I mentioned earlier, she kept a diary um, for many, many years, including a recorded version when she was in the White House. So she just thought it'd be um, more efficient and more convenient to actually record her thoughts um, into the recordings. You can see the tape player over here, it's got the cord and the microphone. Um, so that's pretty cool that she's just sitting there and then look at all the mail and stuff that she's getting. And that ends up becoming the basis for her autobiography. Um, so if you get a chance, you should check out A White House Diary, a uh, well-known book by Lady Bird Johnson. I've read this book. It's really excellent. I really enjoyed learning about her life before, during uh, the White House years. It's really, really fascinating. So if you get a chance, Check that out. And a question for you is, of the First Lady autobiographies, how many have you read? There's actually 12. There's a few other books that are kind of sort of like autobiographies um, or something similar. But as far as like a First Lady sitting down and actually writing out her autobiography, uh, it happened 12 different times. And so you can see here, Julia Grant was the first one. Helen Taft, Edith Bowling Wilson, Eleanor Roosevelt, and of course, Lady Bird Johnson, then you had Betty Ford, Rosalind Carter, Nancy Reagan, Barbara Bush, Hillary Clinton, Laura Bush, and Michelle Obama. Not quite sure yet 
what Melania Trump or Dr. Jill Biden are going to do, but perhaps they'll write autobiographies themselves. The last first lady not to write an autobiography before the current ones was Pat Nixon. And then also notice that Jacqueline Kennedy did not write an autobiography. She said famously, I don't want to spend my time writing about my life. I would rather live it. So she didn't write an autobiography. But anyway, if you get a chance, check out some of the First Lady autobiographies. They're very fascinating perspectives on their lives. And so another cute photo of the Johnsons back home in Texas at their ranch, post-retirement days. If you're in Texas, west of Austin is the Lyndon B. Johnson National Historical Park. It features the birthplace of Lyndon Johnson. Um, and then it also features their ranch that they lived on, the ranch that the Kennedys were on their way to uh, when the Benson Dallas took place. So that's where these photos come. So it's pretty cool to go here. And I've been to this site. Uh, it's pretty neat to go and see what a kind of classic Texas ranch looks like. They actually, um, it's kind of more of a gentleman's type ranch, uh, so to speak. But interesting to see what it looks like nonetheless. And it's a beautiful home. There it is. And have these lovely live oak trees, which are famous in Texas. This tree right here. And pictures of them driving around. So this is actually during the presidential days, um, but it is neat to drive through here and see the cattle. And this is the Texas Hill Country. So you get these beautiful vistas, uh, and these great landscapes that you can see. And then another well-known spot that's associated with the Johnsons is the Presidential Library in Austin, Texas. So this is another good site to see. I've been here many, many times myself. Um, if you want to learn more about not only Lyndon Johnson, Lady Bird Johnson, just the First Lady and presidents themselves, um, and life in the White House and all that kind of stuff, um, fascinating place to visit. Here they are visiting the site while it's under construction. This um, Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library Museum is on the campus of the University of Texas in Austin, Texas, which is just north of downtown. And it's a beautiful park setting on the campus. And they got this beautiful fountain. And then here's the library museum over here. I actually just visited there, um, let's see, when was it? Two months ago. And this is the office that Lady Bird was working from after the White House. So this was her office from 1969. Um, or shortly thereafter, she left the White House because the um, library was under construction for a while um, until she passed away. Look at this cool furniture, <laughs> this really neat retro desk, uh, television, wedding photos, a lot of other photos. So that's pretty cool. I mean, nothing else just to see the furniture decorations neat. And currently at the museum, they're having this great exhibit on Lady Bird Johnson. It's called Lady Bird Beyond the Wildflowers. And it tries to tell people the story. Uh, you know, the thing that she's most known for is the wildflowers, the beautification stuff, and all the environmental lifts. And so this exhibit talks about that, but it really tries to expand people's uh, knowledge and understanding and appreciation of this fascinating woman um, and all the different things that she was involved in throughout her lifetime. So if you get a chance, um, this exhibit's not going to be there forever. I think if I'm not mistaken, it closes in a few months. Um, it's at the LBJ Presidential Library Museum in Austin, Texas. And a little bit about the exhibit. Lady Bird, Beyond the Wildflowers is a special exhibition of the life and legacy of Lady Bird Johnson. The former first lady is most often associated with promoting environmental conservation and the wildflowers that brighten the country's landscape. This exhibition tells a broader story of Ms. Johnson's impact on her family, the nation, and the world. Lady Bird Beyond the Wildflowers guides visitors through a comprehensive story of Ms. Johnson's life, featuring letters, photographs, clothing, and artifacts that will be seen by the public for the first time. Lady Bird Beyond the Wildflowers gives visitors more context to Mrs. Johnson's education, family, campaign efforts, acumen as a businesswoman, leadership in environmental conversation, and her role as a philanthropist. I actually made use of a lot of resources from this exhibit for the program that you're watching now. So I have to give a shout out to the LBJ Presidential Library for hosting that. 
and just a few pictures of the inside of the exhibit. Here's that photo we saw earlier. And then here's one of her at home. And it's really interesting to go inside. There's all these pictures like her childhood and quotes and information about her family and growing up and going to college and like the entrepreneurial endeavors and stuff that she was involved in. Has a lot of her clothes. I'll have to go back to give you that quote again. She said, um, I really tried to learn the art of clothes because you don't sell for what you're worth unless you look good. And that's definitely true for men and women. So there you go. Her life out on the campaign trail. So just a really interesting exhibit. Um, to learn more about her life and go see it in person in Austin. There's the dress that she wore. Uh, remember, this was the presidential inauguration in 1960 that she was attending as the future second lady of the United States. And then just some more information about her and all the different things that she was involved in. So really, a really well done exhibit. I really liked how they put this together um, and gave a lot of insight into her life. And so highly recommend that. And then if you're in Austin, Texas, there's a lot of things named after uh, Lady Bird and Lyndon Johnson. In fact, the most famous spot in Texas is perhaps Lady Bird Lake. Uh, this is a great place to go for a walk. Um, so here's Lady Bird. You can see the wildflowers. So Texas, Austin, Texas, is a lot of really um, fascinating and fabulous things to see and do. Um, and so there's the capital of Texas and the University of Texas and Sixth Street, where they have all the country western music and barbecue and all that kind of stuff. But then another uh, great place to visit is Lady Bird Lake. And if you're still sending out letters and stuff, you can use the Lady Bird Johnson stamp that came out in 2012. And then some pictures from her later in life. This is another great place to visit in Austin, Texas, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. So if you like flowers and nature, and trees and all that stuff, uh, make sure you check this out. This is just south of Austin, Texas. Um, it's a well-known spot with locals. Maybe not quite as well-known with tourists uh, because I think more tourists tend to go to like the Sixth Street music, live music scene or the Capitol and stuff like that. But the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center is really amazing. And pictures of that. Oh, here's interesting. Um, Mary says, I never heard her speak. Did she have a Texas accent? Yes, she did. Hold on to that thought if you're watching this live, because we'll actually hear uh, Lady Bird hosting her White House tour in just a moment. A lot of photos of her later, like um, she's out with her beloved wildflowers or out in some type of nature setting. This is a picture from the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. And another one from there. And there you have it. And this is a nice photo of her later in life. So enjoying the outdoor space and some flowers. And eventually, Lady Bird passed away in 2007. I thought this was a really touching, like, political-type cartoon commemorating her life. So if you're watching this live, sit tight, because in just a moment, we're going to watch this 1968 White House television tour that was recorded, hosted by none other than Lady Bird Johnson herself. So if you're watching this live, I'll cue that up in just a minute. If you can't stick around for that, or if you're watching or recording this program, just look it up on YouTube. There's a recording of it you can easily find. Um, so it's Lady Bird Johnson's 1968 White House Turbo 4. We cue that up. Um, just a couple more things. I wanted to mention that um, it's not easy to visit the White House usually, uh, especially because of the increased security and all that kind of stuff. But if you ever want to go to the White House and you're living in Washington, D.C., you're able to get there in early April, you have a great chance to do so. So this is a picture of Michelle and I, my wife, from a few years ago. And where we're at is the White House 
Spring Garden Tour. So you want to go check this out. This is taking place this year of 2023 on Saturday, April 1st and Sunday, April 2nd. And you can walk around the grounds of the White House. They don't let you go inside um, at this particular event because of security. Um, you can visit the inside of the White House. You didn't have to make arrangements to your Congress person or Senator or something like that. But anyway, um, this particular day, they open the grounds of the White House and you can go walk around outside, and check things out. So it's really cool. It's taking place Saturday, April 1st and Sunday, April 2nd, 2023. If you want information on it, just Google um, White House Spring Garden Tour. It'll direct you to the White House website. They'll tell you all about it. Um, so here is the White House right here. And imagine walking through the front gate or the, and being able to walk around and check out all these different gardens and fountains and seeing the Rose Garden and all that kind of stuff. So it's really cool. Um, they have this every year. They had to take a break, of course, because of COVID, but it started back up again. And I know some people might be thinking, well, you know, I don't want to go to the White House because I don't like the current occupant. You know, that's fine, whatever. <laughs> I've, been to the, I've been going to the White House for 20 years. 99% of the time, you can't even tell who's president because it doesn't really focus on that. And it's supposed to be such a historic site to visit and the grounds are so beautiful. Um, if you get a chance to go to the White House, you should do so regardless of your political inclinations, in my opinion. Um, because like, for instance, you can walk right up to the White House. So this is a picture I took myself. And what they have going on here is this is the Marine Band. You can't really see them easily, but they were playing all this um, great music um, from the Truman Balcony, as this is called. So, I mean, you just can't walk up and get this close to the White House um, on normal occasions. So this is a really special opportunity. And then, of course, the gardens are really spectacular. So again, if you get a chance, and if you're in Washington, D.C., or if you're able to visit on Saturday, April 1st, or Sunday, April 2nd of 2023, make sure you check out the White House Spring Garden Tour. What you do, you just show up at the, like the um, gate, They'll direct you. You'll be able to tell where to go because there's a lot of people show up, especially if the weather's nice. And you just show up there, and they give you like a time entry ticket. Um, so it'll say, you know, you can come back at ten o'clock and get in, or one o'clock, or whatever. Um, but anyway, highly recommend this event. And then, as I mentioned earlier, this is one of a series of programs we're doing on the different first ladies. Um, the next one we're going to be doing a week from today. If you're watching us live, is going to be on Dolly Madison, another person that had a really fascinating and influential life. So we'll talk about her. And then the following weekend on a Friday night, we'll be talking about Eleanor Roosevelt, also a very influential and interesting person. So you can be on the lookout for that. If you're not able to join us um, for those two programs, we'll record those as well. And we'll put them on our YouTube channel, which is Washington, D.C. History and Culture. Um, but this program, of course, is focused on Lady Bird Johnson, born December 22nd, 1912, and she passed away on July 11, 2007. So. Make sure you check out our YouTube channel, which is Washington, D.C. History and Culture. That's the name of our flagship organization. We have all kinds of different historical and cultural programs on there. And we're going to queue up the video in just a moment. So sit tight. We'll watch Lady Bird leading us on a tour of the White House from a resident of the White House <laughs> in just a moment. But before we do, um, let's check in with Patty. Patty, anything we should add or comment on or elaborate on with Lady Bird before we shift off of the video? Well, just one thing that I think um, contributed to her influence is um, LBJ died fairly, uh, he died January of 73, so not that long after he had finally left the White House. And um, so they didn't have a lot of quiet time or retirement time together. But she also, she lived so many years afterwards that she kind of, um, she was one of those solid figures, you know what I mean? That that uh, a person that gave you a sense of continuity in the country. And and I don't know, especially in recent years, I think we undervalue those sorts of people. But yeah, and, and when you hear, I, I love the question about her voice because when you hear her speaking in this video, I think <laughs> you'll really be able to appreciate that. She did embody a lot of uh, really traditional quote unquote, American values that, um, I don't know, you know, first ladies have that opportunity that doesn't always fall up upon the president, if, if it makes any sense what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, no, it definitely doesn't mean um, you have a great point. Yeah, her husband died. Um, he didn't live a long time after he left the White House. And so they didn't really get to spend a lot of time 
uh, together in the retirement years before he ended up uh, passing away. He had a lot of health issues later on in life. Um, yeah, so only four years after he left the White House. He died lit almost exactly four years later. Yeah, and so really uh, unfortunate they didn't get a chance to spend time. And he makes some appearances in the video too. Um, when we did the program last December, um, people responded more, I guess, I don't know, favorably to him <laughs> in the, the video uh, than they might have otherwise, which I thought was um, really, a number of people commented on like, oh, I never, I don't really know much about Lyndon Johnson, but he seems from watching the video like a pretty cool guy. Um, so that was really touching when we did the program. His um his whole a lot of people talk about how he split his effort um and her, I think hurt himself a lot with between Vietnam and his domestic programs, but he had uh, formed his commitment to fighting um especially rural poverty long before he actually got to Washington he, as a young teacher he was a teacher in Texas like uh you know that's what he had gotten his degree in. So that was where a lot of his ambition to improve social conditions in um, or equalize somewhat too throughout the United States. And unfortunately, the timing and the way he got to office, you don't get to control all the details, do you? <laughs> and it's, you, can't, you can't control the external factors, whether it's he was a well-meaning guy, but um, between the fact that he had taken the place of the Bostonian Kennedys um, and very different sensibility there, and um, the Vietnam War, again, intruded, the way he ended up ascending to the presidency, and, um, you know, because of all that happened, I think people felt a sense of ownership um, of, you know, because the whole nation was traumatized by the Kennedy assassination. And so people were engaged in a more emotional way than they had been pre previously, I think. So he suffered a lot from all of those details. Oh, yeah. And it's so hard to kind of judge or critique presidents because it's such a complex role and situation. Like you said, you can't control some of these things that are taking place outside. And I don't know. I just, I, now we're very politicized. I try and just look at things objectively and focus on no, that's why I brought it up because if you if you don't know his whole history you don't really understand what an amazing um I mean he was a very in the the time when politics was really an art and not an attempt to assassinate whoever you didn't like um he was very savvy at it and very accomplished and he did have you know really um sincere ambitions for improving the country um whether you agree with them or not it was he was just a really sincere person I don't think a lot of that um came across easily in the public yeah and it kind of comes through in that video like I said it was really interesting that a number of people just kept commenting on it while we were streaming it the, the last time so we'll, we'll have to see we'll have to see how it fares with this particular um uh, audience. So, okay. Well, awesome. Well, thanks, Patty. I really appreciate you joining us uh, once again and sharing your insight. And thanks everyone who took time out from their schedule. Let me, uh, so I'm going to queue up the video. It'll take about maybe, it'll take a few seconds. So if you need to grab a uh, snack or a beverage, you have a little bit of time to do so, not too, too much. And again, make sure you check out the White House and let me queue up this program. So bear with me for one moment while I queue things up. It'll take just a moment. We switch gears here. The actual official name of this program is called the President's House, FYI.